Welcome to the All of Christ for All of Life podcast, where we equip men and women to be faithful in every aspect of life. This week, you will hear Elise Krapachet's talk from a Grace Agenda years past on Reformation-era women. If you enjoy this talk, make sure you go and find Elise Krapachet's book, Popes and Feminists, on the Canon Press store at canonpress.com. Well, hello, and thanks so much for letting me come and talk to you. This is a subject I really enjoy, and so I'm pleased to get to talk to you. I'm going to talk about the situation that women found themselves in at the advent of the Reformation, and then how the Reformation changed their situation, and also how they contributed to the changes the Reformation brought. The point of telling you about this is to encourage you, because I think sometimes we see our society and the all-pervasive feminism and the way that our society hates God and hates authority, and it can be discouraging, but we can look at it and know that God used women in the past in their mundane and simple duties as part of his battle plan, and I think that he can do that and will do that again. As you know from Becca's talk, and probably just in general, the Catholic Church was pretty corrupt in the 16th century. Um, Becca talked about Alexander and Leo, there's also Julius in there. Leo the Tenth was, um, as Becca noted, a, a homosexual. He was also really given to entertainment. He was apparently a nice guy, enough guy. As somebody, one of his contemporaries said, he just had so many charming traits, if only he'd mixed in some piety, which would have been great. He was very into entertainment. He entertained people really well. In fact, he had on staff of sorts a, a monk who could swallow a pigeon hole. So you never know when you might need that, but he was there ready, ready to go. And he also, this guy, could eat 40 eggs in one sitting. So that's the kind of thing that you might need as a pope. The, so you know it was a really corrupt situation. It was also, I, and I think this is hard for us to grasp perhaps, how all-pervasive Catholicism was from birth to death. Your marriage, your life, your eternal life, everything was, was wound up with the Catholic Church. They governed that. And even in your daily life, what's the biggest building in your city? It's the cathedral. So that, it, it was oppressive in the sense that here you have corruption and something that's not bringing light and life, and at the same time is everywhere, and you can't escape it. So as the Pope goes, so go the people. The official church policy, as we know, was that the, the priests were to be celibate. They were not. They had concubines. The church would levy a tax on them, so they had to pay a penitential tax for their concubines. The children, they had to pay a cradle tax for. If they were to, say, go to a prostitute, then they, if they got caught, they would pay a fine for that. All of this was better than being married. And it was also, it was helpful, because the church had invested in some of the brothels, so the church is making money that way, and they're making money on the fines. It's great, because if you have popes who are getting into a lot of personal debt, and then you can make this money in such a great way, um, you really, you're solving some problems. So. There were priestly dynasties that would continue for multiple generations. Now, obviously, that shouldn't have happened, right, because they shouldn't have had children. The lay people were grateful for the, the concubines because it kept the priests away from their wives and daughters. So uh, there was a popular saying, if you wish to keep your house pure, leave the clerics and monks at the door. Uh, Martin Bootser noted, in the places where the Christian Reformation had not yet been accepted, if one should ask who is the most frisky and lecherous person in the village, every honorable human being would point to the priest. So, all right, I think we get it. It was bad news. According to the church doctrine, so you have this practice that's just horribly corrupt, and then according to the church doctrine, the only really holy people are the priests and the monks and the nuns. And incidentally, sometimes the convents were more like brothels. That isn't great either. But... Um, what you have is all these people that are supposed to be living the contemplative life, they're supposed to be holy, they're supposed to be more righteous than any average layperson could be, and yet they, they live in such a way that's not as all at all uh, reflecting that. 
the Catholic Church taught that work was debasing, it was demeaning, it had no lasting religious significance. So if you wanted to be holy, you needed to join the cloister. You need, and that, by that I mean everyday work, you know, the things that normal people do. If you wanted to be really righteous, you go and join a convent, you become a priest, you join a monastery. A lot of nuns were actually forced into the convents by their families. Sometimes the parents would die and the relatives thought, we don't want to share the inheritance, we will send her off to the convent. Sometimes the parents simply didn't have the money to pay a dowry. So they send the girl to the convent where she pays a cloister dowry because she's technically kind of marrying Jesus. So she has to pay, but it doesn't cost as much as marrying a, I don't want to say a real guy, but kind of. So, but some of the nuns were actually really desperate to go. There was this one woman, and I hope that she was an anomaly, but perhaps not. She prayed that her parents, her husband, and her children would die so that she could enter the convent. And when she got to the convent, she would be devoting herself to divine perfection. They did die. And she told her confessor, this is a quote, by God's wish, my mother, a great hindrance to me, died. And soon after, so too did my husband and all my children. Since I had prayed to God that they should die, it was a great consolation to me. And I thought that after these divine gifts, my heart should always be in God's and his in mine. <laughs> it's so twisted. So there's another girl who was very passionate and her parents wanted her to get married. She thought, and she was young, and she thought, no way. So she jumped into a boiling spa in order to disfigure her face and her body so that she would never have to uh, be married. She could actually join the convent. The problem is, even at the end of their lives, these lives of self-denial, they were still many times questioning had they done enough to escape God's judgment. So all these efforts and still no assurance. So now we know what it's like for nuns. What was it like for women in general? It wasn't great, actually. The church taught that women were intellectually and moral, morally inferior to men. Eve was the source of all sin in the world. And um, they were, women were just kind of, they were not respected at any level. Two Dominican authors wrote a book, and they said, a woman was a liar by nature, a foe to friendship, an inescapable punishment a necessary evil, a natural temptation, et cetera, et cetera, in the end, an evil of nature. In the marriage relationship, the wife was supposed to just be subservient to her husband, but in a way of like one of the sayings, if he beats you out the house by the back door, then return with docility through the front door. So it's not like she should submit in a godly way. If, if there was adultery, it was her fault. She was the source of all the sin. If... Um, there were any sort of marriage problems. He was welcome to beat her if he wanted, but if there were any marriage problems, they were because of her. Marriage in general was, the Catholic Church viewed it as a lesser state than a singleness, obviously. Jerome and Augustine back in the fourth century had taught, they'd taken the parable of the sower and they said, well, the fruit of a virgin's life is a hundredfold and the fruit of a widow's life is 60-fold and the fruit of a married person's life is 30-fold. In the thousand years between that time and the time at the beginning of the Reformation, that had not changed. So the Pope uh, continued to say, one cannot serve God and be married. This was not just a view of the Popes. This was actually also um, shared by the populace. So there were some sayings like, if you get a wife, you get a devil on your back. Or, brief is the joy, lasting the bitterness. So marriage was not... It wasn't respected. The reformers came along and they said, well, obviously we know what they said about a lot of things, but one of the things that they said was all vocations are lawful. And not only are they lawful, but if you are doing something in faithfulness, no matter what it is, how small it might be, God blesses it. He sees it. He loves it. He honors it. Salvation cannot be gained through what you're doing, through whatever your vocation might be. They extended this to women. They extended this to wives and mothers. This is a complete about face in common understanding and in theology, and almost hard to grasp. They thought that women in their daily tasks were bringing glory to God. Martin Luther said the Christian faith opens its eyes and looks upon all these insignificant and distasteful and despised duties in the spirit 
and is aware that they are all adorned with divine approval as the, with the costliest gold and jewels. These are truly golden and noble works. So as a result of these teachings, good homemaking and women who were focused on their homes and who cared about their families and who tried to raise up godly children diminished this widespread ridicule of women. They turned it around. Reformers also, their doctrine of women was totally different. So they started saying, hey, you know what? Women complete creation. Without a woman, we are lacking. We have chaos, actually, without women. Luther says that if you depict women as sources of temptation and wickedness, that borders on blasphemy. So if you think about if your whole goal is, is salvation and you can really know that you can achieve that by joining the cloister, by being celibate, and then you have these women that are tempting you to not be celibate, then they are really seductresses. They are just temptresses and you have to avoid them. For the reformers, they said, no, they're equal partners in the pursuit of the Christian life. That's a big shift. That's a huge change. So these women are considered spiritually equal. Not only that, the reformers are they're corresponding with women. They're getting advice from women sometimes. They're engaging with them. They treated, they honored women in the way that they interacted with them. Luther says, one has to have women. If one did not have this sex, womankind, housekeeping, and everything that pertains to it would fall apart. And after it, all worldly governance, cities, and order. In sum, the world cannot dispense with women, even if men by themselves could bear children. And kind of everyone agreed. So God used these men and women who embraced these doctrines to turn European society on their heads, on his head. Um, so obviously, without the reformers, you don't have a reformation. But it's also true without the reformers' wives, you don't have a reformation. Because you had the skeleton and you needed the flesh. The wives of reformers were the first pastor's wives. If you think about it, before the Reformation, the pastor's wife, in a sense, was the priest's concubine. It wasn't really a revered position in society. So the, along come these women who marry these reformers, and even though they're scorned, I mean, people are saying, if you marry, if a, a priest, an ex-monk marries an ex-nun, they're going to have the Antichrist is going to be their baby. And Erasmus says, think how many antichrists there have been. But they, so they're, they're meeting widespread criticism for this, but they come along and they get to work. So they are hosting people. They are hosting people endlessly, unbelievably. They're having refugees. They're meeting, taking care of the sick. They're taking care of the poor. They're helping their husbands do the jobs that their husbands had to do. They're also setting a new ideal for families. Nobody had seen, like, what you think about it, you look at your pastor and his, his family, and you see what, what is their family like. We want to imitate that. And this wasn't, obviously, you didn't want to imitate the priest and his concubine. So this was a new concept, and it was a, a way that God used to change their society. They're, they were not doing necessarily glamorous jobs, but I think John Piper has this quote about Sarah Edwards, who's obviously a few hundred years later, and I think it applies here. He says, she gave us a gift as she freed up her husband to do his calling. So all this sounds great, but I'm going to tell you about the women, and perhaps it will make a little more sense. Katie Luther was one of these people that engaged in strategic hospitality, like Becca was saying. She uh, had grown up in a convent. Her parents, her father and stepmother, had put her there when she was six. They moved her to a less expensive convent when she was 10 that was pretty austere and also silent. We don't really know how they communicated, but somehow she and 11 other nuns got some of Martin Luther's teachings, and they decided they wanted to leave. Martin Luther was able to coordinate their um, escape with a merchant who took them out on Easter Eve in 1523 in a, a wagon. They got to Wittenberg, and three of the nuns were able to go back to their families. That wasn't always the case, because um, when you joined the convent, you gave up all your ties to your family. You relinquished any sort of monetary ties. So they maybe didn't have money to take care of you, and they maybe were just mad at you. So they wouldn't always take the, the women back. Uh, most of the women got married, so that left uh, Katie, who was at the time Von Bora, and she was unmarried. 
Martin Luther says, I'm not getting married because I'm going to be martyred any minute. But somebody said to Martin Luther, you know, the devil and all his adversaries would just laugh if you got married because everything you've done would be destroyed. And Martin Luther said, I'm getting married. So he decided to marry Katie. And um, he had been a little irritated with her because she didn't like the men he had suggested. And it, that just meant that I think they were perfect for each other. She came in and she brought a lot of changes to his life. He had not made his bed in a year. His bed had mildewed because he had sweat so much in it. And so here she comes to this, and he lives in this abandoned cloister. It's got 40 bedrooms on the ground floor, and they have to start doing remodeling right away. Their wedding night, they had a refugee show up at the door. I need help. They took him in. And that really set the tone for their entire marriage, which was taking in refugees, taking in students, any monks, nuns, pastors, anybody running from the law, which you would be if you were in an area where the Reformation was not accepted. They took them all in. They raised orphans. They raised some nephews and nieces. They had six children of their own. Two of them died young. The, Katie had, a, I think you would guess, a lot of work. She got up every morning at 4, and she went to bed at 9. She, was, she had vegetables. She had livestock. Obviously, she had to carry the water. It's not like they had indoor plumbing. And I think 40 guests and no indoor plumbing is a lot. But she bought orchards. She bought farms. She made beer. She brewed beer. She helped Martin Luther, uh, his health. He was in, always in poor health, and so she really helped him with that. They, she and Martin also took in sick people when the plague came. So you'd have the plague every five years. Some people say maybe a little uh, less often than that. And... It's not surprising because everyone had fleas, and, and at night, apparently, the streets would kind of look like they were moving because of the rats. So it wasn't maybe the best um, sanitary conditions, but at any rate, um, they took people in, even though they knew. They might not have known that fleas were a problem, but they did know if we take people in, we could risk ourselves. Martin said, God has protected Kate and me and our whole family from two plagues. We have been blessed in this city in good days. Why should we leave when suffering strikes? And I think that was a great testimony that they were there, ready to care for others. Katie Luther hosted the table talks, which you may have heard of. People would, students would write down what Martin Luther said, and Katie, um, she would assign the seating. They'd have all these people at dinner every night when he was in town, and they would have theological questions, and he would spout some things off. And sometimes you'll see that Luther says some things that are, like, really dicey. And then some things he says are not so dicey. And I think some of that is when you are just saying something off the cuff at dinner and someone's writing down every single thing you say, maybe that's not the best. And also, if you have a personality like Martin Luther, you're going to maybe say even more. And so I think when he was, you know, his systematic works are a little more you know, not conservative, but refined. At any rate, Katie would banter with him. She would ask theological questions. She was obviously very engaged with him. And in fact, over the course of their marriage, he would seek her advice on things. She was kind of his publishing agent and his secretary. He called her a gift of God, a loyal and trustworthy companion, a theologian, and a woman worthy to be loved. Most importantly, she said herself, we have very few letters of Katie Luther's that have survived none of them to Martin. We have a number of his to her. She says, I want to cling to Christ like a bird to a dress. Through, through Katie, he learned to esteem marriage more. He said, the greatest of earthly blessings is a pious and amiable wife. One person described Katie as the balance wheel in the midst of chaos. And really, she was. She made that place happen. That was in Wittenberg. In Strasbourg, we had Martin Bootser and his wife, Elizabeth. He was a former nunk, monk or nunk, and she was a former nun. And they, um, she had been put in the nunnery of not, uh, she did not want to go. But she had left because she wasn't getting a good education and she was sick. He became reformed when he, or became a Protestant when he had contact with Martin Luther. So Elizabeth Bootser was another really hard worker. She, in 10 years, she had eight babies. She had three miscarriages. She was often caring for people, children who were sick. She also took in other 
children she took in exiles. Her husband was writing a friend one time, and he says, my wife is busy washing. She thanks you for your gift. She offers her excuse for night writing. But we live here with seven boys and four girls. And on top of that, she doesn't enjoy much writing. And she comes along and she writes a postscript and she says, I don't mind writing at all. If only those hungry stomachs and the small fry would give me a little time. Good night. Pray to God for us. Now I have to go to the kitchen. Which is just such a perfect, like, yes, that's what her life was. And she says, she, he described her as humble, as honest, as willing to give him advice or admonition when he needed it. There was, uh, obviously, they had so many people coming to stay with them. At one point, they had a Catholic theologian coming who was, uh, you know, did not agree with them being married. But he says, he wrote Martin Bootser, and he said, I've witnessed your family in Strasbourg. Your household was run very decently. Your wife is modest and diligent. Your children are as good and well-mannered as one could wish. If the church laws were no longer in force, I would have no objections to your marriage. He says, many people have already had the privilege of enjoying your hospitality. Acquaintances, friends, and strangers all move in with you. So you really need someone to take care of your household affairs. Who would not see that you, who do so much for everything and are overloaded with all kind of work, could not keep this up without your wife? It was obvious to his opponents, to Martin Bootser's theological opponents, the wife makes this go. And without her, it doesn't happen. And, I, and Martin Bootser knew that himself as well. He actually described her after she had passed away as, he said, by her diligence and dedication, she so wisely applied and distributed the material income, which was surely not overabundant, that we were able to render far more service to pilgrims and servants of Christ than I ever would have been able to do had I remained single. In 1542, the plague came to Strasbourg, Martin Bootser, well, they, the Bootsers would not leave Strasbourg, which is more correctly, he would not leave the, his congregation and she would not leave him. She and five of their children died. Two servants and a student from abroad also died. So hours before her death, she realizes, obviously, I'm going to die. Um, her husband, by the way, Martin Bootser was this amazing matchmaker, constantly trying to get people married. And so, in a kind of a sad way, she imitated him. So she calls her friend, whose name is Woodbrandis Rosenblatt, which is sad on its own. So Woodbrandis's third husband has just died. And, and so it, he's just died the day before. She can't come out in the day, in daytime, so she has to come at night because it's not proper to be seen in the daytime when you've just, your husband's just died. So she comes over, and Elizabeth says, you two are going to need spouses, and I think this will work out. And Martin just starts, he's just crying. And with Brandis is already, this is her third husband that's died, and Martin Bootser's going to die on her later on. So the poor woman, she'd had a, a rough go of it. But they end up getting married, and they had a little what you might call a prenup, but it says we're getting married for the furtherance of the gospel and the upbuilding of the Christian church. So I think it's like not a modern prenup. <laughs> so I wish I had time to talk to you about Wibrandis because she was a good woman who did a lot of hosting and a lot of just a lot of great things. But there's only so much time. So these are obviously I've been telling you about reformers' wives. In order for the Reformation to be successful, you need people who aren't just wives of the pastors. You need women all over the society. And so what we have next, I'm going to talk to you about a few of those. Olympia Murata, who was born 13 years after Julia Gonzaga, and was kind of similar. I think that was a thing to have these really intelligent women, and everyone loved them until they got married, and then they didn't know what to do with them sometimes. But... Olympia Murata was fantastically brilliant. She became fluent in Latin and Greek within a couple of months of beginning to learn them. At 14, she was considered the most learned woman in all of Europe. So she comes to the court of uh, Rene of Ferrara, and she's going to tutor Rene's daughter. She's lecturing on the classics. She's smitten with the classics, in fact. Rene has Protestant leanings, though. So Rene has Calvin come through her court. But Olympia does not care. She doesn't care about the Bible. She doesn't care about anything. She just cares about her classics. And incidentally, even her modern translators are shocked by her. They said the way that she wields the Latin language is phenomenal. And they said her allusions, the, the person who was translating her was like, 
I've tried to put in the ones I could, but I know there are so many more that I missed. So it, it, she was just even now considered a very impressive woman. She ends up leaving the court because her dad's sick. Her dad converts to Protestantism in this time. She converts, and then she's not welcome back at the court. If you will convert back to Catholicism, we'll have you. Otherwise, you're out. She said no, and this was a hardship for her. She ends up living with her sick mom and her four siblings. But she says, if I had remained any longer in that court, it would have been all over for me and my salvation. So she was grateful. A guy named Andrew Gruntler, Gruntler comes along. He's a medical scholar, and he comes to some lectures in Italy. He admires her from afar. Then they fall in love. Then she writes a hymn for their wedding, like all people do, and they get married. There's a lot of persecution, so they flee Italy. They go to Germany. She, so here she is. She had been at the court. She's got her little brother they've taken with them so that she can teach him. And she's in, she ends up in Andrew's hometown, which is this tiny little village. So she's a brilliant woman. All her career ambitions, not so great. She ends up corresponding with people. She reads Luther's uh, works in Italian. She reads Calvin's commentaries on Lamentations. She's writing her friends ad theological advice. She's writing them practical advice. She's always constantly learning. At one point, she explained to a friend why she studied so much. She said, God gave me the mind and talent to be so on fire with love for learning that no one could keep me from it. Everything is done according to his plan and purpose, and he does nothing rashly or thoughtlessly. So all these things perhaps will be for his glory and my betterment. So there they are in perhaps called Schweinfurt or however you might say that German word. They, it's a little tiny town, but Albert of Brandenburg decides this is what I'm going to use to defend myself from the Holy Roman Emperor. What that means is he laid siege to the town. He pillaged it. He plundered it. Half the people die of brain fever. Olympia and her husband and her brother are living underground for three weeks when, in a wine cellar just to try and escape. So when he decides, I'm done, I'm surrendering, you think, great, then we can have our city back. Not so much. The Holy Roman Emperor's troops come in and they're going to burn the place. They're in the midst of doing this, and Olympia and Andrew and Emilio are trying to get out, And but they think, well, we'll go to the church. We'll run to the church. It'll be safe. But thankfully, a soldier stopped them and said, don't do that. We're going to burn the church. So they left. Well, on the way, Andrew gets captured twice. And then his captors realize both times, hey, he has no money. They don't, they let him go. But they had robbers steal their clothes. They had nothing. They lost all of her writings, all of their books, everything they owned. And they have to run 10 miles to the next village at night, barefoot. So Olympia, this is obviously wretched, but she writes a friend and she says, telling her about well, all this, this has happened. And she, but she's comparing it to her life in the court uh, with Rene de Ferrara. And she says, in all these evils, we have relied on one solace, the word of God by which we sustained ourselves, and because of which I have not looked back to the flesh pots of Egypt, that's the court, but preferred to seek death here rather than enjoy all the pleasures of the world somewhere else. They ended up being um, taken in by a count and countess, and Emilio ends up turning to the Lord at this point. They moved to Heidelberg. Olympia is so weakened from all of this, she dies within the year. And then Andrew starts treating everyone with the plague, kind of with abandon. So he dies, and so does Emilio pretty soon afterwards. But here was a woman who was faithful and who used what she had to bless those around her and honor God with her mind in ways that she probably didn't anticipate doing with her life. The next and last woman I'm going to tell you about is, but there are a lot of them, so you should actually read about them. Just a tip. Jeanne d'Albray was, uh, she's actually a firecracker. She was an amazing woman. She was the Queen of Navarre, which is a little space in between France and Spain. And she had grown up in the French court because her uncle wanted her to. He arranged a marriage for her that she hated so much. When she was 14, they had to carry her to the altar. Worked out great. She never consummated the marriage, and so she got to annul it when it wasn't politically advantageous anymore. She did end up marrying another guy who she actually liked him. They had 20 years of a good marriage. I mean, sort of. He was cheating on her a lot. But it was pretty good for the time until she said, formally, I'm adopting the Reformed faith. 
He was fine with that if it were politically advantageous. When it wasn't, he was less fine with that. So at this point, King Francis I has um, died, and now Catherine de' Medici is the regent in France. She realizes, hey, I could maybe use this whole conversion thing that Jeanne has had and maybe get Navarre back. I'd really like to have it for France. So she decides she's going to drive a wedge between Jeanne and her husband, Antoine. Antoine's fine with this because, really, it was only for political purposes that he was a Protestant anyway. So he goes to Paris, he goes to Mass, he commits himself to the Catholic Church. Jeanne follows along with her son, Henry, not too long after this. And Antoine says, well, I'm going to divorce you or permanently imprison you if you don't go to Mass. She says, I'm not going to Mass. They had a lot of arguments. They had so many arguments that even people in Geneva knew about their arguments. So Calvin was writing her saying, stand firm. They're, they're after you, but stand firm. Catherine is saying, you should submit to your husband. You should go to Mass. And then Catherine says, you know, I'm going to take away your son if you don't do what I tell you. And Jeanne says, if I were in possession of my son and of my kingdom, I would plunge them both to the bottom of the sea rather than go to Mass. So she didn't go to Mass. They end up realizing they're not going to win with her, so they force her to leave Henry with them. She goes back to Navarre, heartbroken, because Henry's going to be raised now in this very immoral French court. So Antoine dies after a number of years. He says, oh, if I'd only lived longer, I would have subscribed to the Augsburg Confession, which was the Lutheran Confession. Maybe, maybe not. But she, after this, she abducts. If you can abduct your own child, she did that, uh, took him from France and rode on horseback through the night to her kingdom, and then she raises him up. At, just to give you an idea of what kind of ruler she was, she made such these economic and judicial reforms that they were still in place 200 years after her death. She was a very intelligent woman, and she was the highest ranking French woman ever to become a Calvinist. She had she started a seminary she translated the bible into the uh, basque language she translated the genevan catechism she studied on her own she was a very intelligent and inspiring woman for her people when her husband had died she the king of spain who was clearly catholic uh, philip said oh i'd like for her to marry one of my sons this is just a little side story and has nothing to do with her reforms. But uh, she says, no, I'm not really interested. But she had to kind of go through the negotiations. I don't know why, but that was the way. So he says, tell you what, you're going to marry my son, and you're going to give up your Protestantism, and you're going to change all your policies. And she says, I am just a little princess, but God has given me the government of this country, so I may rule it according to his gospel and teach it his laws. I rely on God, who is more powerful than the king of Spain. Philip II was totally unimpressed with her. He responded, this is quite too much of a woman to have as a daughter-in-law. <laughs> so he says, I would much prefer to destroy her and treat her as such an evil woman deserves. They didn't get married. The Catholic Church was obviously displeased with her. They ended up excommunicating her, and she really couldn't have cared less, I think. She remained a faithful leader for her people until she died right before the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in 1572. She actually anticipated that something really was afoot. She knew, hey, this marriage is there, it's very treacherous. I know something's wrong, but her advisors were not really listening to her. And at this point, she's quite weak. She's been through quite a lot in her life. And so she ends up, um, thankfully, missing what a disaster that was. Uh, but she kind of knew. So those are just a few little examples. We can, um, but I think if you look back and you think about the society, how it was in pre-Reformation Europe, and then you look at these women, you might see that there are some parallels between that society and between our own society. So do you think about the all-powerful nature of the Catholic Church and how pervasive it was? the corruption and the sexual promiscuity of everyone, including and especially the leaders of society, and the disparagement of marriage and motherhood. We see this in our own society with the feminism and the feminist movement. And a lot of faithful Christian women have been lured off course because we've forgotten these stories. We've forgotten that, you know what, it turns out there's nothing new under the sun, that these sins are not new, and we don't have some, the feminists don't have some special corner on wisdom. It's just plain and simple 
repackaged kind of popery, which is not great. Um, when you see this con widespread disparagement of women that we saw in the Victorian area, that we saw uh, in the 40s and 50s, Christians had an opportunity to stand up and say that's not what the Bible says, and they didn't in the ways that would have been necessary. Feminism won the day. Fem feminism said what we need is to grasp equality. What we need is to have the exact, to be like men. We are becoming the men we wanted to marry. In fact, Gloria Steinem said, which I think has no imagination, I'm just gonna say. They said that women would find personal fulfillment and respect and their lives would be so wonderful. If you could read what Margaret Sanger says about birth control, do you know the kind of utopia that was gonna come if people could just use birth control? I'm waiting. Anyway, they, they pretty much just imitated men instead of actually saying God has given us something to do that is good and righteous and he uses as part of his way of conquering the world. We, you can see that wives and mothers were essential to the success of the Reformation, and I think they will be essential to our success today. The scholarly debates and the intellectual conversations and all of that, they were great and they were necessary. You had to have them, but if you didn't have women doing their little mundane tasks, you would not have had a Reformation. When they were faced with this culture-wide disparagement of women, the defamation of women, in contrast to our own day, they did not respond with agendas and lobbies and protests. There were not Reformation women out with their sign saying, give us, respect us. They actually just said, you know what? If my husband and all these other reformers are teaching that women are equal to men spiritually, I have a lot of work to do and I'd better get on it. And I think that's very encouraging. And when in the first way that they started with their work was scripture. If you are going to leave a convent for you don't know what, you better know that at least you're doing the right thing. So you have to know enough scripture. You had to have studied scripture enough on your own to know this is true. What this Martin Luther guy is saying is right. When you read modern, don't. But if you were going to read modern feminist historians, you would find that they think, oh, those poor women, they left the convents when they could have actually had this all-female religious experience. And I think they should spend some time in a sorority house because that is what it was like, only more regulated, and you could never leave. You're just stuck with these women all the time. So <laughs> women are great, but they need, you know, men. Anyway, as it turns out, when you watch what these nuns did with their lives, you don't think, oh, they were so sad they left the convents. Like, what a sadness that they couldn't have all-female religious expression or be in authority over men or something like that. They said, hey, let's get to work and let's teach our daughters to do what we're doing. And let's take all the things that we learned, all the education that we gained, all of the skills that we gained of feeding a lot of people in a convent, and created something beautiful. They took the tools that God had given them in their lives wherever they were and used those to establish the Reformation with their husbands. So I think the charge is probably pretty obvious. Whatever you do in faith, God sees and God knows, and he's going to bless your obedience. God has taken in the past, and he'll do it again, little acts of obedience and faithfulness, and he uses those to shed his light on a dark world. So we see that these women, they loved their children, they loved their husbands, they opened their homes, they served the needy, and they clung to Christ. Whatever their stations, whether they were wives whether of faithful men or wives of men who were less than faithful or widows or whatever they were, they changed the course of history with their obedience. It was not just a blessing for their generation. It was a gift to us, and I think we have the opportunity to give a gift to future generations. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of the All of Christ for All of Life podcast. That was Elise Krapachet's talk on Reformation-era women. If you enjoyed that talk, please find Elise's book, Popes and Feminists, on the Canon Press store or on Audible.